Some quick numbers on how many kids do not go to school. This year, roughly 58 million primary school-age children around the world, astounding. And nearly half of those kids will never step foot in a classroom. Solutions may lie in a frugal and effective innovation, the kind our next two guests are working on from different ends. Nafez Dakak is a manager at Edrock, the first nonprofit Arab platform for online courses on a mass scale. And Sunit Sangtali is founder and CEO of DataWind, figuring out the hardware side of getting education to kids in effective and affordable ways. They're here talking with Mohammed Aloteba, editor in chief of The National. Thank you, Margaret. Well, it's good to be back on stage again. Um, so we are looking at the, the cost of innovation. We've got, of course, two guest uh, speakers um, who are pioneers in online education and affordable devices. And their aim is to accelerate access to quality education among the world's growing population. Can we start with what business models do you follow to break down barriers, especially in terms of cost, to make sure that you do uh, deliver um, the uh, online um, education and as well the devices. Could we, uh, we can, please, we yeah. can start with enough. Sure. Um, I, I think when we're talking about education, and perhaps about any industry, but specifically I'll touch on education because that's what we're touching on now. When you're talking about sort of the bottom of the pyramid, people that are very, very price sensitive, it's important to redefine a lot of the paradigms that we take for granted as people that, are, that the, edu the current education system works for us. And here I'm talking about sort of the efficiency in terms of division of labor, in terms of does the same person that deliver the content need the same person that facilitates, the same person that um, asks the questions, et cetera. And sort of, I guess, staple or underpinning of doing this as being really data-driven and, and spending time on the ground to really understand what our customers go through and what they need. And underlying this is the principle that we've come to realize, and it's a tough reality to face, that people like us, the system works very, very well for me in terms of the current system, but it doesn't work for our average customer. Mm -hmm. And spending time with them, trying to understand what their pain points are. And I'll just give a quick example. For example, all of us take email for granted. You know, you use email, you send emails, etc. One of the first things we realized with Idrak when we launched, and it's sort of a, an open source technology that we adopted from uh, edX, which is a Harvard MIT consortium, was that a lot of people in the region, the 80% that speak only Arabic, mm -hmm. use email as their username to sign into Facebook. So when you tell them, check your email, they send you a message saying, you know, I've gone to Facebook, I've checked my inbox. Nothing is there. So I guess these are sort of the principles uh, I would come up with. Now, as Idrak, uh, and given that our consumers are very price sensitive, the things we're looking at is sort of cross-subsidization of courses in terms of getting companies and businesses to subsidize courses that in the end deliver what they want on a massive scale. We're also looking at sort of white labeling our platform and offering it to other entities. So neat. Uh, with regards to business models, uh, again, you know, we are a for-profit entity um, and we use low-cost technology to, to bridge the digital divide with a, with a focus on education. We, we realize that a significant amount of revenue gets generated after somebody acquires a product of this nature. Uh, to be able to use the internet, their network services, uh, there's content, there are apps, uh, there's subscription services, there's advertising. And while hardware is essential, it's, it's, the, it's the way that we acquire customers, uh, and currently we don't lose money on hardware, we realize that we can separate the user and the ultimate payer for that. And uh, what we do is uh, that shift the margin, the burden of margins away from those low-cost hardware uh, to the recurring revenue streams that can be generated when the customer uses that. And, and that's the core business model. Um, we're generally known for low-cost devices, uh, but we don't consider ourselves purely a device manufacturer. Uh, we provide, consider ourselves as a service provider or a solutions provider uh, because although the device are, is an element, uh, it's what comes after that becomes more important for us. If I could just go a step back, why? 
So we've got a non-profit organization here and a for-profit. Why are you uh, driving these, uh, these initiatives? I mean, so I guess for me, it's... Uh, and in my mind, education is not the solution to every problem in the region. And I mean, I specifically work on the Arab world, and that's the part of the world that I'm passionate about. But education is part of the solution to every single problem. I mean, name any problem that's plaguing the Arab world right now, and education is part of it. And I guess the one thing that I've come to realize from working on Idrak, and it's the thing that helps me and the team really get up in the morning, is that for a lot of people that don't have regular access to education. Education is about hope. Hope that tomorrow will be better than today, and in our region right now, that hope is, and promise is very important. Um, I actually have one or two anecdotes from some of our users, and these come from Syria, Lebanon, and even Gaza. I'll share one of them now, and maybe if there's time, I'll share more. Uh, the anecdotes in Arabic, this is Ribhi from Gaza. رغم الحرب الدائرة في غزة ورغم ظروف صعبة من قصف وغارات جوية وانقطاع التيار الكهرباء المتواصل إلا أنني حرصت على استمرار المتابعة والدراسة في المساقات التي تطرحها لما فيه من تجربة جيدة ولما يحمله لي من أمل بمستقبل مشرق وجديد. Just to quickly translate. Please in English, yes. Yeah. I read. Uh, this is Rubhi from Gaza, uh, from Gaza and he's saying in spite of the constant war in Gaza and all the bombings and the regular disruptions in power access and supply I've made it my daily mission or being, being, being very active on the platform and continuing my education for what it provides to me as a new experience and a hope that the future will be better than today. Mm. Uh, so uh, I'll give you a two-part answer uh, to why. Uh, as a for-profit business, we think it's the biggest opportunity. Uh, four and a half billion people in the world don't have access to the internet, and delivering the internet, uh, we, we think, t to that next billion, two or three billion, is the biggest opportunity that there ever was, and we think that education will be the driver. So, so that's a, a sort of corporate world answer. Then there's a personal kind of motivation. Yes. Uh, and the personal motivation, again, a personal anecdote, um, I left India, uh, my family left India when I was eight years old. We originally went to Iran, and in 1979, after the, uh, the revolution in Iran, we, we ended up in Canada. And every few years, uh, every four or five years, the family would make a visit back to India. And when I'd visit back in to India, I'd, I'd want to reach out to the young kids that we used to play in the gardens with um, when we were six, seven, or eight years old. When we had left India, I had no concept about economic strata or that that child was the driver's child or the cook's child. We were just kids playing in the yard. But over the years, when I got to see you know, where we ended up in life, uh, me and my siblings, and, yes. and where these friends ended up in life, and I tried to figure out what the difference was, you know, I realized that it wasn't intelligence. Uh, some of them were yes. much, much smarter than me certainly wasn't hard work. Um, and the only real reason that he could sort of point to of where we ended up in life was education. And that became a personal motivation that, that there's a huge strata of society that gets relegated to lower quality of education just because of their economic conditions. And we think that that needs to be resolved. I mean, through with drunk, have you seen um, or measured the impact of um, education on improvement of um, uh, living uh, and, and, and the, the, the economies. Yeah, I mean, so the drop was launched in May, so we have around 120,000 learners to date. Um, around, I want to say, 7,000 to 8,000 people have completed courses, and uh, some of our courses are completing soon, so we'll have more of these completions. Um, anecdotally, we have a lot of people that have actually found jobs after completing courses on Idrak. Uh, and these are sort of specifically employability-focused courses, not necessarily hard skills, but we offer courses on CV writing, uh, resume building, interview skills, mm -hmm. job search strategies. And uh, a lot, we've had a good, amount, good number of people come from these courses to say, you know, I've been through this experience, I've been sort of knocking on all these doors before, but I've never really managed to get a job. And now I'm finally getting responses back, I've finally landed jobs. So there's still a long way to go. 
but we're already starting to see sort of perceptible impact from giving access to people, like Sunit was saying, to this kind of education. And I think this is it's very important to touch upon the fact that the majority of the Arabic-speaking world speaks only Arabic. Uh, and they're really missing a lot of what's happening online in terms of content and what, in terms of development because sort of a, an English-speaking... Uh, or uh, Can you guys hear the noise? Some background noise. Yeah. Uh, there know. is a, yes. Yeah, that's um, no, no, please, that's it. That's please it. go on, yes. No, I was saying, so given that the internet is primarily for these people, offering something in Arabic is very yes. important. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, um, this is um, what uh, is, uh, what the acronym, I suppose, sort of MOOCs, sort of, you know, mass education for, for the people. Uh, I mean, it's being tried and tested in other parts of the world, and some of the well-renowned universities are offering classes online, mm -hmm. but still there is probably some, um, either a hurdle in how uh, people perceive these online courses. 100%. So how do you improve or change that perception mm -hmm. to attract and ensure the users that, no, this is worth uh, taking? Oh, definitely. I mean, so I guess the thing that often ends up happening, especially in sort of Western discussion, about MOOCs is, you know, MOOCs started off with a silver bullet. Sebastian Thron said, you know, there'll only be 10 universities in the next 40 years and everything will disappear. And then he went back on it. I think the, the number one thing to start uh, the discussion on is there are no silver bullets in education. There is no this one solution that's going to revolutionize everything. But what we're trying, starting to see in education is this unbundling of services, this uh, ability to like I said, the main division of labor where people can specialize and improve. And now when it comes to MOOCs, there are a couple of issues to tackle around perception. One is for sort of um, employers and people that will employ people to convince them of sort of the rigor of these courses, the identity of the users, and th there are different ways around that. I mean, uh, Coursera is experimenting with keystroke biometrics. Um, Udacity has experimented in the past with proctoring services. There are ways to sort of make sure that the person taking this course is the person who they say they are. And uh, I mean, you can even, Udacity has worked with Pearson View to get people to take, you, know, you take the entire course online at a much lower price point, you watch the lectures, you deliver it to a lot of people, you do the assessment, but then for the final examination, you actually show up to a testing center. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, for the students, how do you convince them to come and convince them that this is worth their time? It's, there, there are two pathways. I mean, the long pathway is working with ministries of higher education, getting them to accredit it. Uh, I mean, the UAE has certainly been a trailblazer on this front in terms of having a published list of accredited online universities. You have the Hamdan bin uh, Hamad University. So this is starting to happen, but it will take some time. So the part of the equation I'm more interested in is going back to the employers and convincing them that this is worth their time, that the skills have currency. And once you connect these two parts, once employers start recognizing that somebody that's taken a MOOC that's completed it has a certain skill set. And part of it is sort of hard technical skills, but part of it is also this person is self-driven, self-motivated, and able to sort of maintain and retain this material and go ahead with it. And given that technical information and technical knowledge evolves or changes every five years, this will become a permanent part of how people learn and how they work. Because what you learned freshman year college is probably already outdated in your second year on the job. So I think the connection will happen. It will probably take time, but we're, we're getting there. All right. Uh, Sunit, um, you, you named your tablet Akash. What does it mean? And I think you have one of... Sure. So um, Akash in, in Hindi means sky. Uh, and, and this was sort of, uh, you know, what we all want to achieve from education. Yes. You want kids to be reaching for the sky. So it was, it was that kind of... A, intent when, yes. when, uh, when it was named, uh, named in that manner. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're full functional Android tablets. You could just uh, raise it up, just so um, that we just can see it. I mean, so it's, it's the, um, I mean, ergonomics, the, uh, the, the design of the tablet is quite, um, uh, it looks like any other, you know, sort of modern or sort of the latest models that we see from other brands. It doesn't look any different. It, it, it isn't in many ways. Um, the, the reality is that uh, if you buy the latest and greatest today, maybe you've got a quad-core processor in there, uh, whereas we're still using a dual-core processor. Uh, what people don't realize is that the current iPad also 
uses a dual core processor. I see. Uh, so, so uh, you know, our, our focus. I mean, do we need the extra speed? Do we need all that added, you know, memory space? And, and, and do we notice and do we understand it? And and maybe when we're spending five hundred dollars for a product, uh, maybe we make the decision that we'd like to have that. But if my target customer is somebody whose monthly income is two hundred dollars a month, spends half of it on food. Uh, and, and their ability to purchase is in this price point. Uh, is this a good enough experience? Will this meet and beat their expectations? And that becomes a bigger focus for us than trying to figure out how do you create an iPad killer. So your aim is to target three billion potential users. Um, where are we today? <laughs> so, so I will answer that, but I will, I will, I will, I will start with an anecdote. Um, so, uh, one of the ma uh, uh, a magazine that did a profile on us um, uh, had a headline that said the race to the next billion, and uh, my five-year-old son keeps asking me how I'm doing in that race and if I've reached my billion yet or not. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I explained to him recently that we've hit uh, 1.4 million in India, about 300,000 outside of India, and we expect within the next 12 months to be at about 5 million uh, users or so. Uh, we've just done a, uh, uh, an IPO on the Toronto Stock Exchange, raised some capital, and that'll help further accelerate our growth. Uh, and to my five-year-old son, I started giving this explanation and trying to explain that five million was a good number and he should be proud of his father. And, and then he explained to me how many more of these five million need to be done before I get to the billion. To the billion. And then when he discovered the gap, uh, <laughs> he was just very disappointed <laughs> uh, that, that we've, got, we've got a really long ways yeah. to go. Yeah. Now, that being said, I, I am very confident that the world through tablets, phablets, smartphones will get billions of new internet users in the next five years. Uh, we hope we have some role to play in there, but, but uh, with or without us, billions of new people are going to get on the internet and be able to take advantage of the kind of innovative stuff that Nafis and, and others are doing. Uh, because I truly believe that the internet is the most powerful thing humanity has ever created. It's, it's, it's a way of, of democratizing knowledge and information and power. Uh, and, and I think that, that it's something that should be accessible to all. Um, you've, as a profit-making company, you are making money on, on you know, selling the products. Um, the impact uh, on the users in terms of, um, you know, what are they using it for? Is it for education? Is it for, um, you know, just browsing the internet? Um, so, so how do you measure the impact or performance at the user's end? So we've not done any broad study, uh, but um, the, we, we do see impact. Certainly, education is a, a big portion. It's, it's the main focus that we have. But so is commerce. Uh, you know, we, there's a lot of focus around commerce. Uh, we ran a hackathon about six months ago with the University in India where the students created a point of sale terminal on the devices for people that sell fruits and vegetables on carts. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we've got a customer base that has good numeracy skills but very low literacy skills. And they created a graphic user interface that created an inventory customer relationship management system with a point of sale terminal uh, that is being used by fruit sellers with carts that they buy for $35. The incremental value to their business was significant. The, you know, they, the feedback from them was uh, the pilot that we did with a few dozen of these, that the ROI was in the first month, that they generated enough to justify that in the first month. So the impact in commerce is very significant. Yeah. Alibaba just went public, generates $200 billion worth of transactions for the micro-manufacturing industry, not just for the large manufacturers, for the micro-manufacturing industry in China, that isn't available to a small artisan sitting in Afghanistan or sitting in India. Uh, the access to global markets that the internet and that allows, yes. uh, you know, so, so the impact is, is, is there for sure. Great, great. I mean, I've got plenty of questions here, but we can open it to the floor. Um, 
is the gentleman over here, please. Um, oh, sorry. Test. We'll start, I think. Yes, please. Hi, Ashrik. Uh, I'm a representative from The Gazelle. We're an independent news publication run by NYU Abu Dhabi. Students from NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, I have a question for Sunis. Is that right? Yeah. Um, it seems to me that like you guys are working a lot on the hardware, which is great. But um, when you're talking about getting people on the internet, it's really about the getting the connection as well. So you've got a tablet and you've got the services all online, but how do you get those people to the last mile connection between those services and the tablet? I'm wondering like whether DataWin has been doing anything, partnering with any organizations in India or maybe in other parts of the world about getting that 3G connection or that Wi-Fi to like get these people on the internet? Sure, so we generally get known for the very low cost hardware because people would turn around and say, look, I can't buy an iPad cover the, for the kind of price that you're selling tablets for. So hardware is what we get noticed for, but hardware is just the acquisition tool. We do believe that network access and then content and services are both essential. Otherwise, the hardware doesn't deliver true value. So we've developed a unique technology for delivering the internet on low bandwidth networks. We've received 18 US patents around this technology, and we're now partnering with wireless operators to deliver free internet access. Now it's not free in the sense that the operator does get paid for it. It gets subsidized by advertising and other value added services, but we've launched this in southern India in five states, and within the next month or so we expect to go national with it. Uh, where you'd be able to purchase a sub $50 product and the basic access to the internet, the basic browsing, uh, not necessarily with full audio video streaming, but your email, Facebook, Wikipedia, basic browsing would be at no additional cost. Uh, so, so access is a big focus for us and we, we think it's essential. And I'll just quickly mention also with content and apps, uh, we realized that the content and apps for that next billion may not be Angry Birds, may not be a creation from Silicon Valley. It may need to be created locally. So we do a lot of partnerships with the universities and run hackathons. So we encourage students to come up with apps and, and realize that they can come up with solutions in their own environment. Uh, in the last 12 months, I think we've done 21 or 22 hackathons uh, to help create that app development ecosystem in the markets that we, that we operate in. So, so all three pieces of the puzzle are essential to us. Hardware is, 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 is important. Without that, we, delivering access doesn't make sense. And delivering access is essential. And, and ultimately, it's the content and apps that make the rest of the two valuable. And a question over there. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, see, in this podium, we have people who came here to learn, especially young you know, females from Saudi Arabia. We are talking about internet, about tablets, apps, and all the future perspectives that we need the next generation to grab up. We know in sustainability, sustainability development, the most important sector is new generation, the next generation. So we have here female from Saudi Arabia, really admire that they are here. So just I want to ask you to give them your advice. What's, what's next? What's next? Okay, so what's next for our uh, uh, you know, uh, participants here from uh, the universities uh, to go ahead? That's my question, thank you. And maybe to add to it, I think just encourage uh, sort of uh, looking into innovation, looking into uh, a, uh, applying a frugal approach uh, to supplying, uh, offering services, you know, or uh, actual hardware products. But I think that could go for, you know, female as well as, uh, you know, male sort of um, um, uh, talent. Please, any, anything you can uh, so, share? So as, as I said earlier, I, I truly believe the next three billion are going to get on the internet. And I think it's going to happen a lot faster than we think. And what's next and what they will produce is, is something that is a very, very difficult question. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to sort of forecast uh, what will happen. But what will happen is a more connected, empowered citizen of the world, uh, w w which I think is a good thing. The, the resolutions and the solutions that will come from them I think are beyond our imagination at this stage. So far, 
the two and a half billion that are connected um, are not in Africa and in India and in Latin America and the developing world. The next two and a half will be, and I think that that you, you'll you'll get some interesting solutions from that empowered citizen. It, just to add to that, it's learning as well from your failures. Um, it wasn't an immediate success to come up with this product. So what was your journey to get to this successful product in the market? Um, Non-stop failures. Uh, you, you, you know, when, when you look at a company, uh, people turn around and say, geez, in two years you've had overnight success. You, you've gone from almost uh, you know, a couple of million in revenue and you're close to $100 million revenue run rate. What they forget is that we incorporated it in 2000. So it's been 14 years of effort and perseverance and, oh, and, yes. and, and so on. And I could, you know, f f for the two years worth of anecdotes of what went well, I can write 12 years worth of anecdotes oh, yes. of iteration and experimentation and, 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 and efforts. That's, these are two better words, iteration <laughs> and experimentation, yes. yes. And if you want to add something... Uh, I mean, I guess specifically to touch lessons, on, I guess, women in the Arab world, yeah. Okay. Uh, to say very quickly, they are at least 50% of our future and our success, if not more so, and I believe much more so. I mean, our team at Idrak is 70% women, and I think really the future of the Arab world really lies in its women. I think uh, what Sunit touched on in terms of this culture of failure or is, is very important. It is important to fail. If you've never failed at something, you've never tried something worth trying. And I think this, like, the problem with entrepreneurship and all this innovation is this, there's this glorification of overnight successes. Nobody talks about, because it's not fun to talk about, you know, all the sleepless nights, all the sort of missed opportunities, all the failures and all the pain. Mm. And I mean, I know we're up for time, so I guess I'll, I'll end on that. Mm. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunit, for your, as well, insight and um, sharing your experience with us. Thank you.